How did you get interested in, in telling that story? It's actually, uh, it was about a year ago. Um, I was listening to a podcast from the States uh, called Reveal, and it's by the Center for Investigative Journalism. And a journalist there, his name's Trey Bundy, had been researching the cases of sexual abuse by Jehovah's Witnesses in the U.S. for three years, I believe, at that point. And so he had done a podcast about, um, about the issue, and I was shocked. Like, I had never heard of this. I had no idea... Um, that this was an issue, and I immediately wondered what's happening in Canada. And so I started doing some digging and discovered that, you know, Australia was uh, conducting the Royal Commission. Um, there's a charity commission in the UK that was also investigating the Jehovah's Witnesses, but I couldn't find anything happening in Canada at the time. Have you, so have you since? Well, that's nothing official other than the class action suits. Um, there isn't any government, it doesn't seem to be any government investigation, because the Royal Commission in Australia and the UK Charity Commission would be similar uh, to an inquiry here, I believe, and there's nothing it's on the radar that I have found um, that, you know, indicating the government would be investigating the Jehovah's Witnesses. So you spoke to a number of survivors of abuse yeah. for your article. Um, wh- when you were speaking to them, what was their overall mood what was their emotion in regards to this to this subject oh very complex I think mostly they wanted um, to be heard I think one of the themes that ran through each of their interviews was they've been silenced for so long as children and as adults and they really were looking to be believed and heard And mostly they wanted to use their stories to try to protect children from being, any more children from being hurt, whether within the organization or outside of it. Were they pretty forthcoming when you were talking to them about this? Um, uh, About what happened to them? Right. Very, yeah. They were, um, yeah, it was not easy conversations, that's for sure. It was, you know, as an interviewer, you know, you definitely... You, you try not to um, internalize too much, but it definitely affects you. Yeah. Um, what was your response when you approached the, uh, the organization, the Watchtower organization? What response? Oh, they were, um, you know, very quick to respond by email. Uh, they, they, you know, promised they would get a response. You know, I, I, they asked, I asked for an interview. They preferred that I send them questions, um, so I didn't really have an option to do an interview, unfortunately. And I gave them a deadline, and they met it um, right, to, <laughs> right to like five p.m. I think it was on a Friday. So it was right to the uh, right to the minute, um, and and it was uh, you know it was very they 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 really did feel like they couldn't respond to a lot of my questions around how the organization handles uh, child sex assault cases, how you know how they're responding to the class action suits that have been filed. Um, what, you know, like the, just a lot of those questions I outlined in my article, they, they didn't feel that they could respond to those in light of the class action suits. Um, so it was very standard PR answers, it seemed. What, what did they tell you? They did tell me that they, um, <clears throat> that they do not protect abusers, um, that they, you know, uh, let me try to remember now. It was uh, very carefully worded. Um, and because it's a very complex organization, that's, that's another thing is the more I got into this, the more I realized just how complicated the rules and regulations are. And so their response to me was very carefully worded. Um, but yes, they do, they deny, uh, protecting pedophiles. They do say that, you know, child abuse or child sexual abuse is the most abhorrent, act um and that they wouldn't you know basically that they wouldn't they wouldn't protect abusers Mm -hmm. did did you get any sense of how widespread this issue is um well i mean officially we can only really go on the uh, australia case the australia royal commission because they did have um like one thing that the royal commission did confirm is that they Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia anyway, and um, we believe that it's a worldwide, you know, uh, Mark the Elder did tell me that they also did this in Canada, where they do record any 
accusations of childhood sexual abuse within the organization. And um, the Australia Commission revealed, like, confirmed that because the Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia did release over a thousand reports of um, members being accused of childhood sex or of uh, sexually abusing children. So there are um, records of that in Australia. And so I think it was 30 years, in 30 years, a thousand, I think it was a thousand and four members were accused of um, sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. And then when you compare that to the Canadian population, it's likely, if, if it was to be apples to apples, it would likely be a lot higher here. Yeah. Um, wh- what did you learn in terms of um, the organization? And uh, like, wh- what did you hear from the survivors in terms of what makes it difficult for them to, to see justice? Oh, again, it's so complicated. It's like one thing after another between the, the two witness rule, which... Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses require for an, a, um, a survivor to be believed in any accusation of any misdoing uh, or, uh, you know, quote-unquote sin would be for there to be two witnesses. And so the victim or the survivor is one witness, and then they require a second witness. And so as most people realize in cases of childhood sexual abuse, the perpetrator's not doing that in public. It's a very private offense. And so the other witness would be the, um, the abuser. So if the abuser denies the sexual abuse, doing the sexual abuse, and there's no other witness, then automatically the abuser is considered innocent. And so this really puts the victims at a disadvantage, especially children, um, if they're coming forward with, uh, with these abuse cases. Um, there's also, in the past, victims have had to come forward and uh, state their accusations in front of their abuser. And so the Royal Commission really outlined how that is really um, traumatizing for the victims and very, very difficult for them to be able to sit in a room with two elders who are always male and um, their abuser and go into great detail about what happened. So those are two of the biggest barriers. Um, and then when I was speaking to a lot of the survivors, if they're if they went to the elders or if their parents went to the elders or a friend of the family went to the elders, a lot of the time it didn't even get past that. It was just dismissed. It was you know they were told to um, to be quiet about it and not bring shame on Jehovah's name. So it didn't even get to the point of what they call a judicial committee, which is when they would investigate these um, these cases. Did you get any sense talking to the survivors what they what they would ultimately like to see? Change, <laughs> change. They just want change to the process. They want oh, that's all they want is change. They want the um, you know they they want the abusers to be you know the one thing that the Royal Commission. Um, revealed was that not one of the one like over a thousand cases was reported to the police or to child services and so they you know the the um survivors that i talked to basically they they would want all of these cases to be brought forward to investigating investigating officers for them to be investigated they would want you know children to be believed they would want a much different process and how these children come forward um, you know, they would like to see the abusers, you know, dealt with properly and not basically still, so many of them still walking the halls of their kingdom halls, which is their churches. How long did uh, you work on this story? It was a year. It was a full year. Well, so a lot of, uh, a, a lot of stones turned over in, yeah. in your work. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of developments during that year, like with the Royal Commission, their findings came out within that year. Um, a lot of the, the class actions were officially filed. Two of the class actions were officially filed. There's a couple other lawyers also looking at filing other class actions. I know of at least two more in Canada. Well, so you um, started with very little then? Very little, yeah. When I first reached out to... Yeah, it's, it's quite incredible, though. If you start digging, um, you know, when you just even do an initial search, a lot of the people who have survived sexual abuse within the Jehovah's Witnesses are finding other ways of going public and sharing their stories and trying to, you know, get the news out and get the, um, try to increase awareness about this issue and whether they've posted public videos or they've spoken about it, you know, quite publicly. It's, it's, I really commend them for their courage in doing that and, 
even Edith, who I spoke with, you know, she protests outside of her kingdom hall um, just to try to increase awareness among the congregants of what's going on.